All right, great. Well, I'm really excited to be following these talks because uh, last few have concentrated on prebiotic chemistry in the early Earth, and I want to go even earlier, uh, about this early in the formation of the Earth. Uh, so when I think about the life cycle, I think on a more cosmic scale, where we start with a protoplanetary nebula here, which eventually, as a star turns on, collapses down to form a protoplanetary disk. Within that disk, you get condensation of dust grains and ices into larger bodies, comets, asteroids, planetesimals, and eventually planets. And then on those planets, you eventually get the impact of a lot of the leftover comets and asteroids. And at some point in this life cycle, life is formed and then is destroyed in a fiery explosion <laughs> and returned back into the cosmic life cycle. So <laughs> we've heard a lot about getting life from, say, amino acids as a starting material. And we all know that amino acids are found in comets from the Stardust mission or uh, meteoritic samples. But what we don't know in my field, astrochemistry, is how the heck those things got there in the first place. Uh, there have been a lot of theories, but there's no proof, uh, definitive proof, of how those amino acids, glycine being the, the simplest and, and most abundant one we've found, got there to start with. Um, so I'm interested in exactly where in this cycle from the protoplanetary nebula to even impact on the planet did glycine form? Did it form in the gas phase, one of these two phases? Uh, did it form in the icy surfaces of dust grains anywhere along this path? Or did you have to wait until you're in the bulk ice on comets? Or even there have been some theoretical papers that say if you smash a comet into the Earth, uh, the heat of that impact can drive the formation of a whole bunch of organic molecules. Um, so uh, last year I presented on a search for a molecule called hydroxylamine here, NH2OH. And this was kind of the last gasp for trying to form glycine in the gas phase. Uh, this reaction with acetic acid, which is very abundant in the interstellar medium, directly forms glycine. Um, and NH2OH was predicted by astrochemical models to be quite abundant. Uh, but as it turned out, we couldn't find it at all. In fact, our upper limits were about a million times less than what was predicted by the theories. And then uh, some very recent theoretical work has said this reaction has a reaction barrier and won't go in the gas phase in the ISM anyways. So that kind of nixes the formation of glycine in the gas phase as, long as, as far as we're concerned. Uh, so that leaves us with a solid phase. And just about four months ago, a uh, very talented astrochemical modeler, Rob Garrod, uh, used a complex gas grain reaction network to see if he could form glycine uh, in the icy mantles of dust grains. And in fact, he finds, yeah, we can form it, and then we can actually pop it off from those dust grains into the gas phase and use ALMA, our most sensitive radio telescope, uh, to detect it. There's the signal, the strongest signal from glycine, uh, towards a nearby star forming region. And that's really cool. But the accuracy of these gas grain chemical networks relies necessarily on how well we know the starting parameters, what's available to work with in these ices, how much is there there of it, and what's the temperature of these molecules. And the problem is, in ices, we know very little about what's actually there. We think we know a lot, but we have very little proof. This is the list of detected molecules in ices. We know of about 170 or so molecules in the interstellar medium. The ones that aren't in brackets are the only ones that are confirmed to be in ices. The ones in brackets we think we see, but we're not certain. And these are the, the major ice constituents you see here are actually quite simple molecules. And the reason we're having so much trouble is because these observations are being done in the infrared. And the infrared is great for getting simple, abundant molecules, but it suffers a bit for a few reasons. You have to do all of your observations in absorption for the most part, which means that the ice that you're looking at behind it on a direct line of sight to us has to be a really bright source to absorb against. That's usually a star. And that really limits the number of places we can go looking for. So our sample size is low to start with. And the features in the infrared are usually broad, and they blend together in these ices. And you really have to have an abundant molecule with distinct features to pick them out. If you want to look in emission, that would be cool. You wouldn't have to have a background star. But the problem is, if you want to fall on the part of the black body radiation curve where you can actually get light out of the grains in a detectable amount, the grains have to be so hot that you can't have ice on them in the first place. The other problem is the clouds that you're emitting from have such a high optical depth, those photons just can't escape 
first part. So you're kind of screwed for emission. Um, and in the laboratory, you're uh, indirectly measuring the optical constants. That's n, the index of refraction, and k, uh, the amount of absorption you get through here. And these are really important for modelers who are looking at radiative transfer, so how light gets through different layers of ices, say. Um, and unfortunately, indirectly measuring these in the infrared produces errors, and those errors propagate through and make these calculations a little wishy-washy. Uh, so what I want to do is see if we can get a little bit better by looking in the terahertz region of the spectrum. So my background is in laboratory microwave spectroscopy and submillimeter spectroscopy. Um, and in space, astronomical observations, in absorption, you don't need a background star to absorb in the terahertz. The black and gray body radiation coming off of dust is sufficient that you can just absorb against the background continuum. So we can look at a whole lot more places, a wider sample set. Um, and there might actually be some narrower features here. In the terahertz, features tend to be a little more distinct spectrally. Uh, we can also look at emission, because the black body curve allows us to have colder ice grains that are emitting photons uh, that we can see, especially since there's a lower optical depth in the terahertz. So they have a better chance of reaching us, so we can uh, look at their signals. And uh, we can also directly measure the optical constants, so we get ours to a much higher accuracy in the terahertz. So what's our experimental, uh, what's been done in the terahertz so far experimentally? Uh, well, some people have tried to cheat. They take a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer and push it out of spec, and they can get all the way down to about three terahertz, which is pretty good. Um, and they have fairly decent resolution, about one wave number. Uh, but you're still indirectly measuring the optical constants, and the work done so far has been largely on these known interstellar molecules, so water, methanol, ammonia. Uh, simple things that we already know are there. So what we want to do is see if we can look at some more interesting molecules that we think have to be in these ices to form glycine, uh, but we're not certain. So we take a silicon substrate, it's a few millimeters thick, and cool it down to between 10 and 150 Kelvin in an evacuated uh, helium cryostat. We spray gas phase molecules at it, and they freeze into a layer of ice. So and this is a really simple technique. And then we can shoot radiation through it. So we have our own FTIR here for diagnostic purposes. And then we can shoot terahertz through the other way. And then we detect these signals uh, and uh, transfer them to absorption spectra. So here's a layout of the actual spectrometer. Uh, we have our silicon substrate here and our cryostat. Our FTIR gets bounced in. Uh, the way we generate our terahertz is actually really cool. We take a really high-powered laser operating at 800 nanometers. We frequency double some of the light, so we have two colors of light going into our nitrogen purge box, and then we focus it down. If you focus it right, it turns into a, a plasma in air. It looks like a little miniature sun. And it's the oscillation of electrons back and forth in this plasma that emits a very broad, very intense burst of terahertz radiation. So we take that, focus it through the sample, and then detect it on the other side using what's called electro-optical rectification, which is a really cool technique that I don't have time to talk about. Suffice it to say, what it does is it directly measures the electric field of our pulse. That's how we can get these optical constants out directly. We don't have to do any Kramer's Kronig analyses or uh, other assumptions to get these optical constants out. Right now, we can cover from about 300 gigahertz to 7.5 terahertz at modest resolution. Uh, within the next few months, we know we can get ourselves probably up to about 20 terahertz in broadband width and uh, down to about a factor of 10 better in resolution. Uh, so this is what we've looked at so far. We've had our instrument operating for about a little over a month at uh, this level of efficiency. We've done the simple ices so far as well as methyl formate here, which is a very uh, well-known interstellar weed. Um, in a more complex molecule, and we've also started to do some mixtures, and I think my lab mates back home have actually run a few more mixtures while I've been here. Um, so I'm just going to show you results from two here, the simplest and the most complex pure species we've run, because they're spectra, they're cool to look at, but they're all going to look kind of the same if I show you everything we've done. Um, so here's water, the most abundant interstellar ice, and what we have here are just three different thicknesses. So we started putting down ice, and we gradually increased the thickness and kept taking absorption spectra from about 300 gigahertz up to 7.5 terahertz. And you can see here these nice, distinct absorption features are growing in uh, right out in the terahertz region that we're interested in. We can also tell the difference in the structure of the ice. So if you deposit 
at a higher temperature, there's energy for these molecules to move around and get into a, a, a formation that they, they like, crystalline. Uh, if you deposit at a lower temperature, say down at 10 Kelvin here, they just stick in whatever way that they actually hit the ice and they, they, they form an amorphous solid. Uh, so you can see the difference in sharp, distinct features versus a just kind of blobby thing here. Uh, and the formation of this ice, the, whether it's crystalline or amorphous, is a big question in astrochemistry right now. And it has a big impact on the way the molecules move around inside the ice to react, the matrix that they have to, to work with. So here's methyl formate. It's the poster child for grain surface chemistry in the ISM. As far as we know, we can't form this in the uh, gas phase at all. There's a whole whopping ton of it out there. It pollutes our spectra all the time, and it has to be formed on the grain surfaces. Despite that, there's no definitive detection of it in ices. So if we can do that, that would be fantastic. Um, and it's a rather complex structure, so maybe we could see some interesting features from it in the terahertz. This is the same kind of plot. We're just making the ice thicker and thicker as it grows in. You can see here we got actually a lot more structure to the spectrum than we had in water and in different places, which is fantastic for distinguishing things. Um, we can also look at crystalline versus amorphous again. And you see here we're excited, really excited about this spectrum because these seem to be very sharp, very distinct features, even at low resolution. So if you can imagine 10 times better resolution on this in a couple months, uh, we think we're going to get some really interesting features here. So where are we going next with this? Well, we want to compare to the Herschel data archive and the uh, spectra that are coming off of the ALMA science verification data. These operate real near our interested frequency range. Uh, these are state-of-the-art facilities, and the data is all publicly available within the next year or two, which would be fantastic. Uh, ideally, we'd like to operate with SOFIA. The FIFI instrument exactly mimics our frequency range and about the same resolution, which would be fantastic, but it hasn't come online yet. Uh, science testing is just coming up for this new proposal cycle, and they're offering seven and a half hours, of which we're going to get none. Uh, so we're going to have to wait a year to look at that. Uh, but we're really excited because uh, even these preliminary results show that we should be able to identify some more complex molecules and get a better understanding of what we have to work with to make glycine and other amino acids not on Earth, but before we got here. Uh, with that, uh, sources of funding and acknowledgments, and thank you for your attention. All right. Questions already. Perfect. <laughs> uh, are you planning to um, propose Sophia observations for the next cycle, or do you want to wait for we're the have commissioning to of FIFI? <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to wait for the commissioning of FIFI to go online. Um, the great instrument theoretically covers a good frequency range, but the windows they're offering are so small, they cover maybe one or two of our resolution elements right now. Uh, so it's just not a broadband enough uh, system. We'd love to use Fifi, but we don't think we have a shot at seven and a half hours, any of that. You should try. Uh, <laughs> Anyone else? So I realize this is an incredibly long shot, uh -huh. but what are the prospects, if any, for eventually ever detecting a chiral signature on this glycine or anything like that? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know what, uh, how much to give away here. There, are, uh, th there have been reports, mumblings among my colleagues of uh, some possible detections of some chiral molecules. Uh, most of these are just single line detections right now, so that's just one spectral feature, not enough to definitively identify anything. But I would say, especially with ALMA coming online uh, fully within the next uh, year or so, and we should, we should see some detections of chiral molecules shortly, I think. Awesome, thank you. Hmm? Yeah, just a follow up. Can you, are there are any isotopic ratios you can get? Can we get isotopic ratios? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we, we pick up H to D ratios all the time, uh, and, and that's uh, actually how we're trying, you know, not us, but astrochemical modelers are trying to understand the infall of water to form Earth's oceans, say, from the different parts of forming protoplanetary disks. Um, carbon 12 to carbon 13 ratios are easy to pick up from carbon monoxide measurements, uh, as well as oxygen 18, 17 ratios, yeah. All right. Well, if that's it, can we give a hand for all today's speakers?